Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Knowledge Bank. Um, today's uh, webinar is hosted by Ingleton Wood, and they are going to be talking about the Building Safety Act and their experiences so far. Um, the webinar is being recorded today um, and will be available to watch back via our YouTube channel this afternoon. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get through as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Francis, who is going to start things off. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Vicky said, I am Francis from Ingleton Woods, uh, director of CDM here. Um, we have also got a number of other people on a on a panel today. Um, so we have got Dan Legg, who is a partner here at Ingleton Wood. Um, we've got Scott Barlow, who's a building surveying director, Andrew Wright, who is director of structures, uh, Ben Willett, an associate, who's going to pick up bits about project management on this, um, and struggling slightly with his Zoom, we have got uh, Dean Appleton, who will be joining us, um, and doing a little piece about the fire safety elements um, to do with buildings. Um, so th this is the this is the last of our um, little mini series we've done uh, for these webinars, and um, you may have you may have seen of some of us pre uh, presenting before. We today we thought we'd do a bit of a, a roundup um, on kind of all of the topics that we've covered, but also to have a look at the sort of implementation of the Building Safety Act so far. So we are um six months into the sort of real impact on hrbs in terms of, of project works that's where we get our um experience and our and our work from is from um delivering projects as a multidisciplinary design practice on um hrbs so we're going to talk a little bit about that what that looks like and i'm going to kick off from the perspective of uh, acting as principal designer um so the building breaks principal designer so far what we've seen um this is all in the context of of higher risk buildings that we, we've looked at so far um and then as i say the the others i introduce them as we go i'm going to talk about um their experiences and, and what they're doing um and just a little bit about the, those services and, and what they look like um so from from the perspective of of what we've done so far um, we are appointed across uh, a multitude of different projects, different different types of, of HRVs, um, from refurbishments to new builds, etc. Um, and we are facing what I would say is quite common problems um, and quite common sort of comments from, from design teams uh, and client groups. And it all stems back, I think, to perhaps still a little bit of, of lack of understanding, um, perhaps lack of real clear guidance from the regulator so far, um, and a little bit about of everyone's just getting used to this kind of new regime that we've got within the industry, um, and we, we've just got to get used to working with it and dealing with it, and I think in a yeah, you know, with the with the passage of time, with the with the experience of more and more projects done, it will start to become easier and easier. But I do find myself a lot having to having to sort of do lengthy explanations in meetings, um, in design team meetings and and client meetings and the rest of it. And a lot of it stems back to the logic: Why are we doing this now? Um, what's this extra kind of cost on my project? Why is it delayed? And all all the rest of those sort of comments. Um, and I've found where I'm going to kick off today, one of the kind of most uh, easiest way to explain the logic of what we're doing with the Building Safety Act, why we've got these rules and all the rest of it, is to start with the word uh, home. Um, and so if you'll think about kind of that word and, and what it means to you, it's all going to, it's going to mean something different, different to everyone. And what we're actually talking about is building and refurbishing um, and making safer people's homes. Now, a lot of the time we're going to take that in its, you know, put the definition up here. We're going to take that in its noun form, um, you know, the house, apartment or any other shelter. Um, that is a usual residence. That's the kind of way we see it. 
But actually, if you start to think about that second definition here, a home being the place at which one's domestic affections are centred, if you start to see it in that context, then a lot of what we're being required to do here uh, under the Building Safety Act makes a whole lot more sense. It's about creating uh, safe spaces for, for people to live in. And obviously, in terms of what homes mean to people, um, and particularly when we look at high-rise residential buildings, a lot of the time it's going to be in a scenario where you've got a client who's owning the building and we've got tenants um, who are living with, within that space. And there's a, there's an inherent kind of lack of control over what they've got in their space. So if we look at it in terms of a, of a decision tree almost, but this sort of upside down pyramid or triangle gives you an idea of what we're talking about. In terms of decision making for that building, if you take an isolated higher risk building and think about between all the parties that are going to be involved uh, in a project. It can be any project to, to that building. Um, so imagine we're doing some sort of refurbishment project. In terms of the decision, in terms of the influence, in terms of the control, um, we can visualize it in this way. Our biggest decision maker, our biggest influence is the client, it's the owner of that building. Um, and then we have the designers that follow in there. So they're going to decide what we are going to be actually be building. They're going to do the specification. They're going to do the drawings. And they're going to follow that through. The contractors coming in to the, uh, deliver the project, where well, they're going to take the design that they've been given. Um, and they're going to interpret that design, perhaps do a little bit more design, and they're going to actually build uh, or do the works within that premises. And then right at the bottom there, we've got the, the tenants. Um, they may get consulted, um, they may get asked uh, for opinion, certain circumstances, they may even get to, to, to make a few decisions. But in terms of overall, they have got the least uh, control and the least influence on what is going to happen within that building. If we then think about the risk, now I'm not talking business risk, I'm not talking financial risk, I'm not talking any risk, I'm talking about health and safety risk, personal risk from the building. So if we think about what risks the building presents to the life and well-being of, uh, you know, humans, and we think about who is actually in the firing line of the risk, we can use the same upside down triangle, but we're reversing, uh, you know, the, the parties. The uh, individual group who is most at risk from the risk presented by that building it's going to be the tenants because they're living there. Um, contractors then come next because they're going to be working in and around and to that building. Uh, designers then less so, but a little more so than the client. They're going to be visiting um, and the client is taking, you know, the least personal risk. They are less, the least likely party out of the four to end up being harmed um, in terms of health and safety by that building. And actually, you can see that's a that's a huge imbalance if you look between the two, because you've got the party with the least amount of control and influence um, are at the most risk from the building. And that is, in a nutshell, what the what the the Building Safety Act is forcing us to think about is to think about that that group who are at risk from the building need more consultation they need more influence and they need more involvement in the decisions that are made about their homes if you are looking for a little bit more in-depth logic um in terms of the individual requirements that you perhaps are facing now that you're, you're not quite understanding or not quite getting what's what's happening or what the logic is or those parts of the act and the associated legislation that is making us all scratch our heads and go, this is a bit of a pain. Um, we can look back to, to Dame Judith Hackett's report, um, which as many of you, you have, have perhaps read was quite a scathing view of the, gave us quite a scathing view of the construction industry and the way we're going about maintaining, um, and and doing refurbishment and building in the first place um higher risk buildings um and there's quite a direct logic between the individual requirements of of the uh or the individual conclusions uh, of her report and 
the requirements now that we have under the, under the Building Safety Act. So it's quite an agreed standpoint that there is a need for change within our industry. And this is the, the kind of the last six months have been the first kind of step along the road towards that change. And again, the kind of conclusion that I am frequently sort of pushing out towards the project teams that I'm operating within is that it's meant to be difficult because it's not about us carrying on how we did projects a year ago. It's meant to change our mindset and it's meant to change our experience of, of working, designing, maintaining these buildings. Um, so that need for change is there. And as essential parties uh, involved in this, as um, as stakeholders as designers as maintenance firms whatever your role is uh, within this industry and and whatever responsibilities you have towards a hrb um there's an inherent requirement from this building safety act to be leading the way so compliance is is obviously um, a necessity um but there is now this kind of added idea that we should be doing things if we can do it we should do it and what i mean by that is that aiming for minimum compliance probably isn't quite enough anymore um if there is a practical way of making these buildings better of making them safer if there's additional information um that can be ascertained reasonably about the building then we should be doing that and we should be getting that on record um and we're seeing that in our current appointments um so in in terms of the where where we've got to uh as a, as a practice as an organization to this point on projects um we've taken a number um through to to you know gateway to applications uh and we have a a, a number more that are, are kind of in the design period leading up to that we have, haven't completed any yet so we haven't haven't done the applications for the for the gateway three yet but it, you know, similar package of information is going to be required. Um, we're gaining some really, really useful experience from these these sort of gateway two applications, and the the we're quite lucky and able to do it across a variety of of different building types. Um, be that in a healthcare setting, um, be that in a new build residential or um, exist in recladding uh, works. Uh, Ben's gonna gonna run us through a, a few project examples of the, of that kind of cladding focus that we have um, as a team here. Um, the fire remediation, renovation, um, and some some flood damage repair projects as well. So we're getting a real mix of the types of projects that we're doing. Um, and every type of project that we are doing on on a HRB is is being have having to be done in a different way. Um, and I've used a, a kind of an example of a information tracker, um, a very very small part of a. I think it was about forty five or forty six lines within that of information we were trying to get together um, when we, we were kicking off a, a gateway two application. Um, as you will know, within a within an existing high rise building, when we're doing a gateway two application, we've got uh, this this eight week application period where we need to submit, you know, our statutory documents and our design, um, and wait for a decision process. But in terms of the the impact on the project, you know, I've used one from back in February as an example because that only went in as an application a week ago on that particular project and pulling together all of that information was absolutely essential now a lot of the lines of information that we would have required we would have needed anyway but there wouldn't have been such a stop point in terms of collating all that information um if we had uh, an outstanding sort of updated fire strategy information document for example under a previous regime, we could have cracked on and, and added that influence into the design at a later date. But instead of that, we've got this kind of absolute point by which we need this developed design. And we need all these surveys. We need all these existing information on the building collated, um, reviewed and 
have that input into the design. So in terms of that design period, particularly in existing HRBs, it's we were expecting the impact of the eight weeks for the for the application to hear back from the, the BSR. But actually what we've ended up with, with is, is even longer periods before that eight weeks even start. So projects that formerly we we may have got to got to site a whole lot quicker. Um, we're now not able to. And I think in the context of um that, that example I say of the, the flood damaged HRBs that we were talking about, that's that's uh that's a really good example of a project where it, under the old regime we'd have probably just got a contractor in and on site and and you know worked out the design as we went along as it were so we would sort of had them in assessing taking stuff out um to have a look at it but actually we're not able to do that on flow we've got to do that assessment of what we need to um what we need to design to fix prior to um getting anywhere near kind of that rectification so what have we seen so far um in terms of common themes um probably common common problems um that we are facing on on projects well as as a general rule client expectation um that the building management company is going to do it all on their behalf um that's really really common um why why am i doing this i i i pay a building management company to do this on my behalf um clients are having that lack of understanding of the roles and responsibilities who does what when um the act itself is is putting a lot of onus onto the client a lot of responsibility onto the client for for taking um control and giving all of the available information um engaging a lot more uh, with their buildings it's not enough uh, now to just stand behind and say we put up the money we don't do anything else there's an expectation under the under the act that the client is a lot more involved um the next kind of most common problem and again um is existing information um it either doesn't exist um or it's in extremely poor order um, it's not digitalized. It's still sitting within a folder within a locker at the base of the building or at somebody's offices 200 miles away. Um, and it is causing huge, huge problems. It's out of date. You know, we're, we're picking up fire strategy documents from from pre-2010. Um, we, we can't design off that. We can't submit application. Um, we're also finding that design information side for the gateway too is 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 hard to achieve because we have to have it to a point where the design is developed so you can build from it so you can do that building control um building regs compliance piece of work to ensure that everybody who's signing their declarations to say this is a compliant design um is happy um it's actually quite a challenge to get you know almost a stage five pack out and done before you've even set foot on on site it's a very weird uh way of doing it something that we've we've never really done as an industry so again adapting to that is is a lot of is, is proving challenging um the cost of change control is not fully understood um as a as a brief kind of whistle stop tour of what that is if you're not aware anything we change in a project that falls under the definition of notifiable change or major change uh, has to be re has to be submitted to the regulator during the construction period um, that comes at a cost of 108 pound per application plus 144 pound an hour for the regulator to review it um, the the few that we've had so far are averaging between 12 and 1500 pound for a review of of you know a change and um if you, if you go and look at the the high risk building procedures regulations where the, where the list will be of notifiable major change there's quite a lot that falls under there um you know we we we're, we're you are doing projects that are not fully there or you know a client decision or a design decision gets made to 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 move locations of internal walls uh, or change the layout of the uh mechanical ducting and therefore you go for a wall in a different place than you're expecting all of these things are going to fall under um, notifiable 
um, or major changes. And because of that, each one of these is coming with a cost. Um, and I know particularly on, on projects that are um, either insurance led or um, perhaps some of the recladding works that we're doing, there's a very finite budget um, put towards the, these jobs. And, you know, you can, you can extrapolate, you know, imagine a, a project that you've been involved in, think about the changes that happened during that construction period. Um, and, and imagine you were paying, you know, 1200 pound per, per uh, each one of those changes that were made throughout. You can see how we, we're concerned about those costs escalating quickly. And it's something we're not able to, you know, from a QS perspective, you're not able to, to budget overly easily. Um, delays, delays, delays. Another example, everything is not moving as quickly as before. Um, and I don't see that as a negative. I don't see, you know, it, it's it's problems in the context of individual projects, but actually that delay, that extra thinking time um, is, is exactly what the, the act is, is designed to do. Um, and then we have the sort of last couple of common things that we're seeing exist in HRB projects that sort of lengthy PCSAs we're having to enter into. Uh, that goes back to what I was saying about the, the kind of gateway to design and getting us ourselves into position where we can build straight away. Um, and I think what's also coming through as a theme is the concern of the regulator's ability to, to cover and interact with, with all of our projects. Um, there is, there is, uh, you know, a wider piece um, that, probably give you an hour's talk on about the 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 sort of building control industry and the problems that that's facing but you you'll have likely seen that all um acro across your 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 sort of industry news anyway um that there is a real concern there about the ability for for us to do that um i think my screen is actually frozen on the slide there let me reshare Uh, information next. Is that reshared, re guys? Or is that not? No. Sorry about this, guy. Let me just try again. Screen to share. Is that back now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. That pause there on those ones. Um. So, in essence, to kind of end, what I what I'm kind of talking about is it all boils down to information being um, paramount, being the most important thing. Surveys, reports, drawings got to be on the agenda of these projects earlier. Um, as I mentioned about existing HRBs in, in particular, start viewing the, the contracts as design, then build, not design and build, if that's the way the, the contractors is going. And the most important information that we are talking about in the context of the uh, the BSA is fire and structural information. Um, so we're going to split off into to a small focus here. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Andrew first regarding structural reports. Um, then Ben is going to give us, a, a, a I think it's two or three, um, existing HRB cladding projects um that that we've kind of i think um either completed halfway through and one coming up i think are the three um and then dean will will close us out with some information around a bit more detail in what the fire information surveys look like and the level of detail that you you would need to go to in terms of um searching searching for information or um going within the building and looking at that um so uh Andrew, if I uh, hand over to you now. Thank you, Francis. Um, so I, I'm, I'm Andrew. I'm the uh, Director of Civil and Structural Engineering in London. Um, we are working on high-risk buildings uh, as, as structural engineers at, at the moment. Uh, most recently, we completed a gateway to for uh, a hospital, uh, a major hospital. Um, and after years of um, of, of 
the industry thinking about energy performance and such, structural engineering seems to be coming back to the forefront again as, as a result of, of these changes. Uh, and the parte check were, were very detailed and, and, and uh, we had to comply with them before the project could move forward. So we had to actually get the, the parte approval done before the project could proceed any further. So it was, there was a lot of pressure on us on that one, but we, we succeeded there. Um, with regards to, uh, to, to, to to structural surveys um, of, of high-risk buildings. Um, these, these feed into the, the safety case report and then need to be updated uh, as the building um, uh, moves on in, in age and, and things happen and change to it. So it needs to be constantly updated. Um, and typically uh, what, we're, what we're looking at there is uh, given a description of, of what the building is and how it's been constructed. Um, and and then undertaking a, a, a risk assessment in essence to see where where the problems could be um, with it and 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 given advice and 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 um, uh, for, for for now and and future users of of, of that report. Um, so, with regards to uh, to structural things, what what are we looking for? We're we're primarily looking at part A uh, of the building regulations and also structural safety and how it works with regards to fire. Uh, but not exhaustively in fire. There are other people to pay into, but how does the structure deal with that? Um, also, um, how would the structure deal with um, uh, unexpected events, which I'll, I'll come into in, in, in a moment. So we're looking at the foundations, load bearing systems. How does the load from the roof get down to the ground? Um, and is that done safely? Are there transfers of loads um, at, at different levels? And, and, uh, and is that working properly? Um, we collect... Um, do a desktop review of all the information that's provided that's that's available for the building and this is where uh, francis's point on record information for buildings quite keen we we never find enough information it's not kept uh, properly and I, I i've always in my experience found that this is basically the, the gold dust uh, if you find something on a building otherwise what happens is you end up doing uh, expensive intrusive investigations to prove what what's there um so then we're thinking about cladding support and other secondary structural systems, which are reliant on this primary structure and then also secondary fixings to the structure and how they perform in, in, in its life. And also with regards to, to, to fire performance of some of those fixings as well. Horizontal and vertical stability systems. So we're, we're thinking about how is the building stabilized um, in the event of something unforeseen happening? How do they perform? Um, and then, I, then out of that, we identify structural safety issues on the building. One, a, a couple of examples that, that, that have recently appeared in the news of this is, is something called disproportionate collapse, which is say, if a part of the building had a gas explosion in the kitchen, say, or there was a vehicle impact on a, on a load bearing column uh, down, at the, uh, down at the bottom of the building, how, how would the building react to that? And, and buildings have to be designed in such a way where obviously they, they wouldn't disproportionately collapse if that was happening. Either. There wouldn't be a total failure. The building wouldn't do very well, but it would be able to support itself still if, if a key element was removed. An example of that is recently in, in Bristol where the council had to, to rehouse a number of tenants from a, from a tower block that they have there because I presume that one of these safety audits was undertaken and, and they found out that it hadn't hadn't been um, looked after since it was built in 1950 and this this was an issue um, so so that's the sort of uh, thing we're looking at that that then we also look at has a building been modified has there been structural refurbishment done on it and that all gets built into this into this safety uh, this structural survey of the building which we produce as a report and then it goes as a record as it gets submitted um, to the PSA as well um, other things just to, as, a, as a whilst I'm on to just to note that Aberdeen Council also recently um, had to rehouse a number of tenants from their, from their buildings because of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, which is RAC. This has been thought of only been mostly been in schools, but some people are finding it in roofs in residential buildings. So, and also it can be used as cladding as well. So we, we, that, that's something that might, um, that would be picked up in the uh, building safety audit. And also we've had been working on some defective reinforced concrete frames. Those have been in the news as well, where people have been housing them and then subsequently they've been found to be wanting and structural strengthening works required. Um, other things to think about with the building as well, which these sort of structural surveys will pick out is that you may need to do concrete testing and masonry repairs as a building ages. 
the materials deteriorate and, and that can cause problems as well, particularly with waterproofing issues and, and other things as well. So that's basically a whistle stop tour of the um, of, of structural survey requirements for, for the BSA. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Ben now, um, who's got, who has actually been working actively on this sort of thing as well. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, my name's Ben Willett. I'm a, a associate building surveyor in our London office. Um, I've been um, involved in uh, various cladding replacements um, quite heavily over the last three or four years. Um, we've uh, so uh, we've started completing a few. We've got a few at various stages. Some on site, some completed, uh, and some at design stage, um, waiting to get off the ground. Um, just was going to talk to you about a, a, a three of these projects and and sort of pitfalls and issues that we've we've picked up on a, on a lot of them. Um, the first one here is uh, 417 Whip Lane, um, which is uh, in Hackney area um, in East London. Um, your picture there you can see um, uh, of the building. You can recognise the West Ham Stadium in the background, but don't hold that against it. It is a, it is a lovely building, I assure you. Um, the uh, works on this one uh, involved uh, replacement ACM and insulated uh, render cladding um, and uh, at the cost of about of seven million pound. Uh, we were involved in architecture, project management and contract administration. Uh, the project was run under the JCT DMB contract, uh, which DMB is design and build, uh, commenced in June 2022 and completed uh, December 2023. Um, we had a few issues uh come up on this M one of the main issues we found was uh, a development next door had been built up uh extremely close to our building uh literally around a, about a foot away probably less than that nine inches um which made it impossible to to um replace one of the elevations um uh, one of the rendered elevations. Uh, we were able to sort of liaise with the uh, fire engineer on the project on this and we're able to um, put together, uh, effectively um, put a, a, a B-rated EWS1 uh, for that area of the building, that block, uh, and the rest was was A-rated, which uh, assisted the uh, the client in ensuring they could ensure um, ensure their buildings and also sell their sell their flats as well. Um, there was issues with the tight site with scaffolding on the site as well. Um, one of the main issues we've came across on this and certainly on some of our other buildings, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, which are some of the older buildings that we um, that we're doing this work on, is uh, there is a, a clash between statutory requirements and a lot of these buildings. So um, where we are taking off the old um, more combustible insulation it has a better thermal performance than the non-combustible insulation as a result we then therefore need to find way we need to put it back thicker insulation um to enable us to meet the um, thermal requirements of the building regulations now this is an issue in the fact that obviously it's it's a practical sense that it's thicker than what was there before so we need to either um be able to infill existing SFS um, uh, with with thicker insulation, or it will affect the the cartilage of the building itself, um, which became a bit of an issue on this this building. But we were able able to get around it with the planners on on that. Um, the other issue we had is touching on what Andrew spoke about beforehand um, with structural issues. We we are obviously we we have no idea. We had no. Um, as built information on this building um we it, we we did some investigation but obviously until you've taken everything off the building you're not going to be you're not going to know exactly what's there um with this we had lots of issues with the sfs framework which wasn't built very well in the first instance we then had to do some reinforcement um on that which obviously added to the cost and the um uh and the uh, time frame of the of the works um, we did mitigate this best we can. We, we had a very helpful contractor who um, did a lot of opening up and we we put together a sort of schedule of rates for these sort of works so we could assess it as we went around. Um, and we we allowed that in the programme prior prior to commencing work. So um, what could have been some quite difficult uh, issues to deal with had they had we come across them when we were on site was mitigated um, 
uh, before we'd got to site. And then touching on to the building safety regulator on that, this this building was done before um, the need to apply for the building to the building safety regulator. Um, but had we had that been the case that we did need to apply and these sort of issues had come up during the build. Um, we would have touched on the 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 change that Francis was talking about, um, which we would absolutely have had to have done an application, and there would have been a lot of uh, fifteen hundred pound uh, um, applications to get it reviewed as as we went along. But luckily, in this case, um, uh, we'd mitigated it beforehand, and obviously there wasn't the need to do the building safety regulator application anyway. Um, so next one we've got here is um, two Stannery Streets in um, Kennington area near the Oval. Um, this is a range screen cladding and roofing replacement, three million pound project. Again, we were asked to work on architecture, project management, contract administration, uh, a JCT DMB contract um, that started in September uh, last year and is due to complete September this year. Um, we had similar issues with this one. Obviously, it's a building we had no information on. Um, we've taken some uh, some of the uh, cladding off, and it is a, a bit of a um, uh, I don't know how to delicately say it. It's not the not the most well built building, put it that way. So we've come across quite a few issues. There's also a lot of water ingress, um, which we knew about in any case, um, which is why we're doing works to the roof. So it really it's not just a, a, a a sort of a cladding replacement in, in for reasons of fire safety is also to um improve the 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 building's um uh well just just improve its condition in general really um issues with this is obviously a busy location as you can see from that photo um the scaffolds um on right on the uh right on the curb side um We've also got issues with a lot of stakeholders on, on this building. So we've got residential, uh, commercial and um, office space in this building. There's also a separate freeholder um, who we need to run everything by, um, by uh, all changes by with it as well. Um, so that there's obviously a lot of, lot of uh, hoops to jump through with any changes or, or anything on that. Again, as with Wick Lane, this, wasn't, um, this didn't require an application to the BSR. Um, so we've been able to um, avoid um, that as a as an issue, but again, had had that been the case, there may have been a lot of issues we should needed to for further application. So sort of goes that adds on to what Francis was saying about the need for um, having a full uh, as, as full a design as possible before work start. Um, finally, I'll just talk about Brody House. Um, this is one that we are currently in the design phase and will require a um, building safety regulator application. Um, this was a, a, it's a historic building with, um, so we're carrying out replacement insulated render roofing and, win and window replacement, uh, two million pound project cost. We are um, acting as architects, project managers and contract administrators again, uh, run under the JCT standard contract with a start date due for September, 2024. Um, just touching a little bit on the design with regards to building safety regulator. This was actually a um, uh, an old warehouse building which was converted in the 90s. Um, we are aware that it's got um, a uh, insulated render on it. Uh, initially, we had a fire engineers report done uh, in I think it was about 2020, and this was before the introduction of the FA, FRAEW and PAS 9980. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with those, um, for FRAEW stands for Fire Risk Appraisal of External Walls, and it's uh, sort of a standard way to appraise the the, the fire safety of uh, of the external walls of the building. Um, PAS 9980 is um, a methodology for carrying out these um, uh, FRAWs. Um, so how that relates to this is that we initially, what we've got here is an insulated render, but there is also some spandrel panels in the window and some ACM um, cladding between two, two of the floors. Uh, initially, when we had the fire risk assessment done, uh, sorry, not the fire assessment, the initial fire appraisal done in 2020, that recommended replacement of all the render and um, the uh, the ACM panels and the spandrel panels. Um, we have since had um, the FRAW carried out. 
um, which because it's now a, a more holistic approach to the fire safety of the external walls, it has meant that we have not needed to carry, we've only now need to do the works to the render. Um, and rather than the spandrel panels and the ACM, um, because of the the fact that it's only the um, the render which is a cause of a fire spread across the building. Um, so since the introduction of the FRAW and PAS 9980, it's made these, um, there's a, it's a standardized way to, to measure the fire safety on these buildings, which has made this outside of things easier. So it's a much clearer way um, a clear direction of what what needs to what needs to be done in each building and um how we would do that which is dictated by the fire engineer who's appointed to do their fraw so it, it it basically gives a clearer line of guidance about uh, we can read these fraws it makes recommendations of what needs to be done and we can we can action that um, from our role as as project managers and designers um so going forward that is how all of our all of our projects will be um which is um obviously makes uh makes life easier for us and obviously the process a lot clearer um and easier for us to sort of direct clients on that um i think that's pretty much pretty much covered everything that i had written down um i'll now pass you over to dean appleton who's going to um speak to you a bit about um internal fire safety thanks ben um for that um yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dean Appleton. I'm, um, I'm an associate within the Colchester office um, and I work part of the um, yeah, the specialist fire team here at Ingleton Wood. Um, we have a wealth of knowledge. Basically, we've um, we were started. Um, we started in this field before Grenfell. Um, and so I've built our knowledge base on on the basis of that. And obviously, since um, since that disaster, we have um, we've carried it forward and expanded our knowledge and expanded our client base. Basically, what we um, what we look to look to do is assist our clients and that so a lot of block managers um, that we that we deal with. Um, but not only that, it's through the healthcare, the education sector, um, defence sector um, in kind of understanding more um information essentially with with regards to fire compartmentation and internal fire spread um essentially we we can be involved at a multitude um of of, uh, of stages throughout the construction and also indeed more probably the management of of the actual building itself um once it's been constructed um we may be involved early on to provide advice um in relation to to fire safety materials that may be installed or how to how to actually conduct those installations uh, or indeed what we commonly find is um, once an FRA has been undertaken and it's been identified that there are potential risks within the building um, within the fire compartmentation then we we tend to get um, our clients call us at that stage um, and sometimes we unfortunately get called slightly too late um, which is maybe when the uh, the fire service have actually been involved and they may have um, they may have actually served the notice to um, to the response person and there may be a partial closure or full closure of the building and um, and therefore will result in um, yeah works needing to be expedited uh, very quickly in order to provide a safe building for people to occupy so we get involved um, yeah in a, in a varying amount of buildings um, different building types and and also at varying stages um, a lot of the the stuff that we deal with so when we're talking about compartmentation often gets forgotten about um, and certainly has been over the years uh, generally speaking uh, you may have a building where there is a, um, a full ceiling whether or not that's plasterboard or indeed a, a, a suspended ceiling um, and a lot of the penetrations and breaches and um, and items we see are generally located within these kind of forgotten spaces that you know out of sight out of mind um, now I'll just take you through um, roughly the the services that we provide initially and kind of talk through uh, kind of real world scenarios that we've been involved in um, shortly afterwards. Now, generally speaking, on the on the survey side of things, um, we carry out um, bespoke bespoke services for our clients. Um, first of which is is a as a passive fire protection survey. Um, passive meaning that essentially um, the the product will sit there and and it will essentially um, yeah resist the 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 um, fire and smoke spread uh, throughout the building without actually activating um, it's things like fire bat, intumescent mastics, um, fire collars, and things like that that will basically sit within the um, the fire compartmentation walls. Now we'll do a, a review on those. 
um, throughout buildings on a sample basis or on a 100% kind of um, compartmentation basis, looking at the walls and also the ceiling, ensuring that the gaps between the services and also any any kind of holes within walls and also indeed if, if it's possible looking at the actual construction of the walls and ceiling as well in order to ascertain whether or not they are actually of a fire rate of construction. Now, separate to that, we also um, carry out specific fire door surveys, um, an important part of the uh, the actual fire compartmentation as a whole within a building. Um, obviously, you would have heard in the news, um, not only obviously with Grenfell, but obviously several other buildings that the, the fire doors are something that because they're used on a regular basis and um, are subject to uh, a high amount of use and generally a high amount of damage, um, the, the condition of them and the status of them can change quite quickly, almost minute by minute. Um, now, our fire door review, generally speaking, um, will obviously focus on the the main routes of um, the the main routes of escape, the protected uh, corridors. Um, can include, obviously, now uh, given the change of the regulations, the main entrance doors to each flat um, individual flat unit. Um, and essentially, what we look to do is we look to break down each fire door on an elemental basis and ascertain um, where the breaches are, what needs to be done, and ultimately provide recommendations to our client in relation to repair or replacement. Now, we also have a mechanical team um, that can carry out fire damper inspections as well um, in relation to the ventilation in these spaces. Um, and also what we do is we also offer a full fire compartmentation survey. So that would be almost all of those three all together to give you, uh, you know, our clients a, a full um, understanding as to what the compartmentation on site is like and also what needs to be done. A service that we also provide is um, whether or not that's that's post completion of of a of a building um, straight off. So whether or not it's just been completed and someone wants a, an independent third party check, that's what we will carry that out and um, and provide our recommendations and findings based on that to ensure that the building has been constructed pr uh, properly in relation to fire safety. Um, and what we'll also do is if if works have been undertaken recently to to an existing building, we can also check on that um, and and provide our recommendations. So um, yeah. Few, few surveys there. Now we we do also carry out works on on the um, on the back of these these recommendations if there's any required. Um, and again, we can kind of tailor those to our clients' requirements. Um, now, generally speaking, I'll just take you through quickly. We we kind of take it right the way from from the brief and also kind of what's what's required site site findings, and then take that through to formation of specification, management of the tender process as well to select appropriate accredited um, third party certified contractors in order to carry out the works and then management through um, until completion. Generally speaking, we, we do find that because these areas are, like I say, out of, out of sight, out of mind, they, they, you know, they're not always wholly visible at the, uh, the start of the project. So generally speaking, they take a lot of management and a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of working through as, as we're on site. Now, a, a lot of what we find um, is the, the, the first part here, the vital information. Um, generally speaking, sometimes our, 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 our clients, a lot of people don't have this whole list of information. Um, and it's something I think people are getting better at and, and potentially need to understand that these are, um, you know, they're, they're legal requirements to, to have um, in order to manage a, a building properly in regards to fire safety. Now, one of the most important things um, under the regulatory reform fire safety order is obviously the fire risk assessment that should be carried out on a regular basis by a responsible person and competent person. Um, Essentially, that will indicate um, risks within a building, and that does touch on fire compartmentation, um, fire doors, fire dampers, and, and things like that, and how the building is evacuated. Um, the fire strategy as well, which kind of drills down more in detail about how the building is used um, and whether or not there's any um, any personal evacuation plans, any peeps um, within that as well. So those two kind of go hand in hand almost. Now, one thing that's quite important for us to undertake our surveys and works is the fire compartmentation plan, which will let us know exactly what the walls are required to achieve in relation to fire safety. Um, fire alarm testing logs and also damp te testing logs also give us a good idea as to how they're being used, how they're being maintained um, and whether or not there's any problems with them. Now, again, just touching on that kind of post works um, review, I mean, information about what the doors might be constructed of, what the walls might be constructed of um, and any information to relate um, to recent works. So we were also extremely handy for our review. Now, vital information really generally moving forward. Um, Really, it's essential that any works that are undertaken are managed on site. So if, if you've just had a survey done or you've had works undertaken in relation to fire safety, it's good to then manage um, works 
following on, we we oftentimes find that we'll we'll complete a project and then a year later down the line we'll get a call from a client to say that they've had the IT um, uh, contractor in and and then we've got load more holes that haven't been managed and haven't been made fire safe. So we you know the process starts again. So you know it's a it's a live moving. Um, uh, a building so essentially we need to we need to kind of deal with it as such and make sure that that any works following on from from what we've done gets gets um gets managed well now generally speaking we've just put up a, a few photos here um what we tend to find is that uh, the first one's a, a cross corridor door. There's absolutely no compartmentation up there at all. So it's obviously quite a significant, serious break there in the fire compartmentation wall. Um, so we do find that quite a bit where, where thought hasn't been kind of given to what's above. Generally speaking, a lot of what we find is cable and pipework penetrations. That's maybe either whether that's existing or, or new penetrations that, again, haven't been sealed with appropriate material or even any material itself itself. Ventilation ductwork, again, may just be provided with a volume control damper, so not necessarily a smoke or fire damper, whether or not that's linked to a fire alarm. Those kind of things need to be assessed. Um, redundant services that may have either been just cut off or indeed removed, leaving just holes in the in the, the voids as well. So over the years that these buildings have occupied, so we find a lot of that. A lot of what we find as well is the, the junction between the wall, the actual compartmentation wall, and the also uh, the, the compartmentation ceiling as well. Uh, generally speaking, they're, they're not sealed as well. So there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And uh, what we what we always find is is poor application of, of you know passive fire protection um, or, or works to fire doors. So um, it's, it's kind of quite key to make sure that the right people are involved and the right materials are involved and also that they're carried out correctly together. Now, just uh, just touching on the fire door non-conformities, um, a lot of the doors we we look at um, do do require works of some description. Um, again, because they're heavily used, at least we, we we're generally seeing that um, excessive gaps are something that we um, we find quite quite a lot um, because the doors are used, the hinges kind of start to relax, and and we we get a, a slight excess in that. Um, the the tolerance itself isn't very large, so so it's key to maintain those. Uh, we also find that generally speaking, you know, older doors will include non-fire rated hinges, um, maybe non-fire rated glazing. People commonly think that Georgian wire glazing is fire rated. Um, however, that that is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, we also find that the intermescent smoke seals, um, if they are installed, may be very damaged, may be worn, may be painted over um, over the years. So need to be reattended to. Um, and as I said before, generally speaking, what we find is a lot of damage to these doors, the leading edge, the rear edge, um, and, and the damage to the actual core itself. And therefore, um, the door won't act uh, as, as it should do. Um, some, something we also find as well is um, we have uh, fire rated doors in non fire rated compartments, something we found recently um, in a large property in Reading. Um, and again, whilst that's not strictly speaking um, going to put the building at risk in relation to the fire safety, what it does is, is it creates confusion. Um, so it may be that actually materials and resources put elsewhere, um, but also these these walls then get get maintained, the doors get maintained in, in inappropriately, um, and therefore it's kind of a wasted waste element element to the um, to the client. So um, yeah, a fair fair bit to to consider in that. But um, but that basically concludes my slide. So I'll hand back over to Francis but I think that's us done isn't it yeah thanks Dean Perfect, thank um, yeah I, I think um, there's a lot there I think everyone will, will kind of hopefully see I think that was the, the general idea of what we're doing is to show structurally fire um, and from the project management point of view you see how much is going into this and I think I hope you understand the sort of common theme that we're seeing is that it's it's information 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 um, existing buildings are lacking um, and the information sort of not being present is is causing additional additional problems to already complex projects so when we look at the way we manage buildings going forward retention of that information and, go and good storage can not only save money but it's going to save the sort of delays um, and, and make for much safer better projects um so yeah thank thanks guys for for um doing those talks and thank you all for for listening um vicky i don't know if we've got any questions for the last five ten minutes that have come uh, in there's, there's actually no questions that have come in at the moment so i can leave it open for a moment and if there's anything that anybody does want to ask now um then they can pop them in the q a box 
Um, otherwise, if we don't get anything come in, then um, if you can send me a copy of the slides, then I can pass them on to everyone who is registered. And then if they've got anything they would like to follow up with any of you directly, um, then they will be able to do so. Yeah. I've, I've, I think as well, I know because of the nature of, of this type of subject, um, some people might not necessarily want to ask questions. Um, in in this forum here but obviously um as, as vicky had said as well so obviously feel free to um to to email the the um the email address uh, up on your screen but also um we have a, a a very good website where our details are there as well so if you wanted to specifically contact somebody such as francis on the health and safety side or, or andrew on structures ben on the on the the cladding or myself or uh, on the on the passive fire then then you can find all of our details there as well and if you wanted to answer a question we would obviously be more than happy to um to answer those um yeah in a different different way okay yeah that sounds good um i mean no one submitted anything so i think we can leave it there um as i said the webinar has been recorded so i will be able to send out a link to that this afternoon um i'll also include a copy of these contact details so if you do have any questions you can follow up with any of the guys um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you all for your time in presenting today. And yeah, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest thank of you. your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.